All right, today we are looking at Hebrews. It's our second part of Hebrews. Last week, we talked about Sabbath rest. This week, we're going to talk about active rest. And it's just because of uh, some of the verses we looked at last week, but we're going to kind of emphasize the, the latter part of the book. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11, it says, Strive to enter that rest. So there's only two things we have to define. Strive and rest. We're going to start with rest. I want you to turn whoever's close to you. What does rest look like for you? What's a great day off? What's a great vacation? What's a great break from your day? What do you do to rest? Go ahead and turn to whoever's sitting right by you and see if you can't figure it out. Okay, section one. Did you come up with anything? What's rest for you? To not have to worry. Just take a break from worry. That's excellent. In the middle section, what, what is rest for you? Going to the beach. Ding, ding, ding. Good answer. Good answer. Section number three. Sleep. Ah, yes. And in the back. No, sleep's been taken. Come, come up with a new one. No expectations. So whatever it is for the time, just no expectations. Very good. Now, for some of us, rest is completely passive. Just, you know, don't want anything to be happening. Kind of the absence of activity is rest for you. For others... Your rest is very active. If you want to go to the beach, you're going to be somewhat active. Now, you may just lay there like a slug while you're there and get a lobster red stomach by, like, somebody I know. Uh, but in the end, for some of us, um, rest is actually kind of active. I like to do activities in my rest. I don't like to just sit around. I like to decompress by doing. So today, we're going to look at what rest means. But before we do that, we have to figure out strive. Rest, we kind of all know what that is. We, we use that language. When's the last time you used strive in a good sentence? You know, it just isn't something that just pops into your, into your vocabulary. So go ahead. Turn to whoever's close to you. What does it mean to strive? Go. A quieter conversation. Rest is so much more fun to talk about. Okay, section one. What does it mean to strive? Extra effort. Very good. Working towards something. Very good. To go after something. Very good. In the back. These are the guys that were sleeping before. They just wanted to sleep. I don't care if you've already used that. Okay. Intentional mindset. Very good. All of those, very good for strive. Let me quickly look at what um, we can learn from the text and from the original use of the words. Rest. It doesn't just say rest. Strive to rest. It says, strive to do what? Enter that rest. So there's a specific rest that it's talking about. That rest will be called God's rest in the text, and then later, the Sabbath rest. So that rest is a specific kind of rest that we're going to get into today. And strive is kind of fun. To exert, to work hard, to endeavor, to be diligent, to make haste, to be intentional. My dad had a couple expressions when I was a kid growing up. The first one you're going to be offended by, but it's what he said. So this is true truth right here. My dad used to say, I don't want to, talk, I don't want to see you talking about it. Like if we were supposed to be cleaning our room or raking the leaves in the yard or whatever the job was we were supposed to be doing. My dad would say, I just want to see butts and elbows. That's all I want to see. <laughs> butts and elbows. Now, for me, as a child, that worked very well because children are very concrete in their perceptions. And I understood what that meant. I don't need to be standing around looking at him or talking to a sibling. It's engaged with the work. I don't want to see anything but you engaged in the work. The other statement he had was, when I say jump, I want you to jump through yourself. I never could figure out what that one meant. <laughs> Which made me not, you know, do the first one. Okay. But in the end, it is, it is about effort. When Israel was going into the promised land, how much striving, how much effort was there as they were approaching the promised land? 40 years of it, right? It was just hard on top of hard on top of hard, hard, you know, effort, 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 effort. Once they got into the promised land, how much effort was there? How much striving was there? Yeah, it's kind of like, God, you gave us this promised land. Why don't you just have everybody else move out? No, they, they had everything they did, they had to do now by God's direction and with God's spirit and by God's empowering, but they still were very active in what was happening. For Jesus, as he is doing good, why did Jesus get in trouble on the Sabbath day? 
because they thought the Sabbath day was the day you were supposed to go neutral. Jesus sees a Sabbath rest as doing the will of God, doing good. You could say it either way, right? If you want to know what the, the Sabbath rest that the book of Hebrews is talking about, look at Jesus. It should look familiar. It should feel familiar when you think, okay, the way Jesus lived his life, he did good whether it was the seventh day of the week or the first day of the week or the third day of the week. He was constantly doing the will of the Father, saying what the Father says, doing what the, he sees the Father doing, and only doing what God directs him to do. That is what Sabbath rest is all about. It's more than a day a week. It's something that is a lifestyle, and it's the lifestyle of Jesus. So, rest is not about being passive or timid or holding back. It's about doing good and doing the will of God. Now, Hebrews 10, 19, let's read this and then we'll pray. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith and with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed pure with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as we see the day drawing near. Let's pray. Lord God, as we look at how you want us to live our life before you, it's easy to characterize what that is by rest. You want us to live a life in you that is a life characterized by rest. And so often that's the exact opposite of what we're experiencing. So each of us today needs to hear something a little different, needs to see something a little different. Each one of us has something that's pulling us away from that rest, that's, that's keeping us from the rest that we have in Jesus. And I would just pray that for all of us, whether we are brand new to the faith, whether we have yet to come to faith, or whether we've been believers for many decades, that Lord God, all of us would experience a deeper level of rest in you as a result of studying your word today. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So active rest is what we're going to be talking about. The first thing I want us to see is that it is a new and living way. It is the way of living that brings life, but it's new. It's not the old kind of tweaked to make it a little bit better. Honestly, I am amazed at how much the old covenant sees the new covenant, but just kind of falls short. But this is not the old covenant being kind of, um, you know, like a home improvement project where we're going to fix up the old covenant and make it a little bit better. No, this is a completely new reality. This is a new way of living. And in going to a new way of living, sure, the old helped us be prepared for the new. But in the end, what we're going to talk about today is not old. It's not the same old, same old. Some of us, as we grew up, some of us grew up in the church. How many grew up in the church or some kind of church going, attending? How many didn't have any really much church background at all, right? And then kind of everything in between. How many went to a church that neglected to give you the gospel? That was the one I kind of grew up in. Good denomination. I won't bash it or anything. But when I came to Jesus, I was mad at them. It's like, you guys knew this stuff and you just kept it to yourselves? This stuff is life-changing. The bottom line is, as, as we live in Jesus, being raised in the church or being raised in a family of faith or not, both have their advantages and disadvantages. The advantage of being raised in the faith is if it's a good reflection of what we're going to talk about today, that really gives you a great start in life. But if it's a family of faith that's still living under the old deal, the old covenant, and it's all about law and rules and all of that, that probably didn't help you at all, right? And for those that, that didn't have that family to grow up in, you probably have some advantage that you don't have to de-learn all the legalism. In the end, this is about a new and living way, and let's find out what that is, and then you can figure out later if that's the way you were raised or not. Hebrews 10, verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way. 
Paul says it a little bit differently. Paul says, you know, there is, there is the law of faith and there's the law of works. The law of works is the old way of doing it. It's the old way of thinking about it. I have to do all the things. I have to do the works of the law. And if I do that, then I'm one of God's people. He says, now we live by a different way. We live by the law of faith. And faith, if you read Romans, is not a work. Faith is the foundation for the new covenant that we have. So, in America, what does normalized American Christianity look like? As much as Christianity helps shape the culture that we enjoy as Americans, I would argue that just as much the American culture has shaped our Christianity, and not for the good. The average Christian in America is what Becca, my daughter Becca works with horses, and one of the phrases that she has for uh, describing you know, different types of horses, there's one horse that's called unconfident, an unconfident horse. You would probably call it skittish. You know, it's just a little bit, you know, it, it, it twitches at anything that you do. It's unconfident. It doesn't have confidence in itself. It doesn't present itself as confident. You can look at a horse and know if it's confident or unconfident. There's a lot of us as American believers that walk around very unconfident. We are not confident in who we are. And that's what Paul's addressing here. There's a lot of believer, Paul, sorry, it just comes out. This is what the writer of Hebrews, whoever that might be, this is what they're saying. That there's a bunch of people falling away and a big part of the problem is their lack of confidence. But for American believers, normal is just broken. And we just kind of let the broken part just stay in there with the rest and this is what happens. Instead of being confident, we have fear and worries and we hold grudges and we take shortcuts and we blame other people, and we make excuses, and we play games, and we're controlling, and we use emotional manipulation, and we're invalidating others so that we can feel good about ourselves, and we're grumbling, and we have negativity, and meddling, and disrespect, and giving up. We have a victim mentality. Any of that sound familiar? Hopefully, you don't have all of those. But do you have some of those? Are there some of the things there that are still a part of your, your daily experience when in reality Jesus died on a cross so that you could find a new and living way. And there's no room in that new and living way for those things that are just a part of the American lifestyle. Hebrews 7.19, for the law, and it's talking about the old way, and this, by the way, would include keeping of the Sabbath. It's a part of the law. The, for the law made nothing perfect. We will come across the word perfect multiple times today as we go through. Let's remind ourselves, perfect, the biblical definition for perfect does not mean without error. In, in our language use, that's what we mean by, we say, oh, that's perfect. That means there's no errors. I got a perfect score. I, I didn't get any answers wrong. That's perfect. That's not the biblical understanding. The biblical understanding is fully matured, fully developed, fully formed, Right? So, understanding that, the law made nothing fully formed, fully matured. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. As we looked at some of those breakdowns, some of the brokenness that, that we keep in our faith, fear, worries, doubt, what are they if they're not a broken hope? If they're not a broken faith, I would even say a malignant faith, a cancerous hope. When, when you have fear, you, you are doing the opposite of hoping or having faith. You, you're hoping and having faith, but in the worst possible scenario, not in God's highest and best for you. The law, the old way of doing things, makes nothing perfect doesn't allow you to fully form and develop as a believer. So first, there is a new and living way, and that's what we're going for, and we need to not settle for a legalistic lifestyle. Second, active rest is about drawing near to God. That's what he just said. 
Hebrews 10, 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. So confidence will be used six times. Assurance will be used four times. These are reoccurring themes throughout the book. But draw near to God with a true heart in full assurance of faith and with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. How many of us have an internal narrative that is undermining our faith? In our mind, on the inside, the thoughts we think, the things we tell ourselves, completely undermine what God is trying to do. We are not confident in our faith. We do not have assurance in our faith. We have tremendous doubt, and it's found in that internal narrative, that evil conscience. And our bodies washed with pure water. Let us, now who's, who's doing the effort here if it's let us? We are. Let us, in other words, engage at this point. Let us hold fast. We're the ones that need to hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. So the bottom line is, if the thoughts you're thinking are wise, they will lead to good. If the thoughts you think, you're thinking are foolish, they will lead to evil. They will lead to a conscience that is giving you a very horrible narrative. Hebrews 4.16. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, which is so much better than the throne of judgment. You've watched those movies about the Middle Ages. You're called before the king. You're not called before the king because he's trying to make a new friend. You are called before the king because you're about ready to be judged. And the throne was really a place of judgment. But that's not the throne we stand before. We stand before the throne of grace. That we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So how many are currently in a time of need? How many are recently in a time of need? How many most likely will be in a time of need sometime tomorrow? Yeah. I mean, times of need just seem to keep coming around quite regularly. Two things, active and passive. Passively, we receive mercy, and actively, we find grace. Hebrews 7.25, Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So first, being saved to the uttermost, like what is that? How many think that's a lot? That's probably as far as you can go. Completely and fully saved, right? You are saved to the uttermost. Not just because Jesus died on the cross for you. I mean, that's clearly a part of the equation, but that's not the reason he gives. He says, because Jesus is making intercession for you. Where is Jesus right now? Right hand of the Father, right? So as he's interceding, it's a nose-to-nose -nose conversation. He is constantly interceding for you right now. And because of that, you can be confident that your salvation will be deep and profound. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since always since he always lives to make intercession for them. Active rest, and you probably would see this coming, is also about faith. Faith is, as Paul says, it's the law of faith that now allows us to enter into this new and living way, this new covenant that we have. Not a law of works, of performance, but a law of faith. Hebrews 10, 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Hebrews eleven six, my favorite definition for faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God, do you notice how many times that gets repeated? This is all about, I mean, this new and living way is built on drawing near to God. Must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So we make faith all kinds of things today. Positive thinking. I'm just believing God for something that God doesn't necessarily want me to have. Or is he, you know, it's just something I want. So I'm believing for it. No, faith is believing that God exists and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. It doesn't have to be any more complex than that. And it's very helpful, very effective. 
Why would we pray if we don't believe God is there? And if we believe God is there, do we also believe that he rewards those who diligently seek him, actively seek him? So in the, in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, you have Gideon and Samson and David and Sarah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Rahab and Moses and all these different people of faith. As you look through chapter 11, would you characterize their faith as passive or active? All of those people of faith, are they just, I'm just believing God and I'm over here sitting on the couch. Or are they people that are actively living out what God is leading them to do? They are active in their faith. They are resting in God, but active in their faith. Then next, active rest is about imitating Christ. You probably saw this coming too. But not just imitating him, imitating the people in your life that are following him well. When you have somebody that's following Jesus well, it just gives you a, a better sense of what does it mean to follow Jesus. And if you say, I don't have anybody like that in my life, that's a good assignment. He said, you should not neglect. I'm going to read this in just a second. You shouldn't neglect having those people in your life. Hebrews 6, 11, And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end. Which, by the way, is another ongoing theme. That this is all about enduring till the end. So that you may not be a slug, which is abbreviation for sluggish. Okay, you thought slug was that little critter that, like, you can go fishing with or something? No, slug is short for sluggish. That you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who, through faith and patience, inherit the promises. So it takes faith and it takes patience. Sometimes when you're struggling with faith, you're not really struggling with faith. You're struggling with patience. This is all about enduring. And that's where he's going to end in this, in this discussion that we need to hang in there. So with faith and patience. Hebrews 10. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Good definition of what Jesus came to do. To love us well and to do the will of the Father. To do good works. Let us consider... How to stir up one another to love and good works, which is a productive faith, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. So I ran into somebody this week who uh, used to attend Vista for years, and they just wanted me to know. I mean, they were so excited to see me. They just wanted me to know that they are still faithfully following Jesus. They just need to work on Sundays and just can't afford to be here. This is a season to make money, not a season to be in fellowship. And I would argue with you that that person is still going to heaven. I genuinely believe they're still following Jesus. When people ask me, can you be a Christian and not go to church? The answer, hands down, every time is yes. But I would follow it up with another question. But why would you? Why would you try to follow Jesus and not have a whole bunch of other people speaking into your life, encourage one another, literally means to speak into each other's lives, and just be an example for you. Why would you not want somebody in your life that you're going, yeah, that's the way I want to live my life. I want that person. I want that influence in my life. Why would you hold back from that? The bottom line is, we can, we can be believers in Jesus and not be in fellowship. But Why? So imitating Christ, it's helpful to not imi just to imitate Jesus, but to imitate the people of Jesus. And an active rest is about growing up. This word for perfect means to fully grow up, fully mature, be fully formed. Hebrews 9.9, 9, according to this arrangement, and he's here in chapter 9 talking about the old covenant. According to the old covenant, Gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshipers. Under the Old Covenant, the Old Covenant accomplished what it was supposed to accomplish. Lesson for another time. But what it didn't do was clear our conscience. It was, it was powerless to change us from the inside out. It was an imperfect sacrifice offered by imperfect priests for really messed up imperfect people. 
Now, it was obedience to God. It was, it was setting up the, the whole sacrificial system and the shedding of blood and all of that, which Jesus came and fulfilled. But the old system, in reality, didn't work. It was just a stepping stone to the system that we have now, which is in Jesus. It could not perfect, it could not mature the conscience of the worshiper. So as, you, as you're here today, how's your conscience? How's your internal narrative? How you doing? Because you can hide it from everybody but Jesus. Hebrews 10, for since the law, and again, this would include Sabbath keeping, but since the law has but a, was but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can neither, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect, make fully mature those who draw near. This new way of living is all about drawing near. And, and the old way of doing it, the, the, the keeping of the law. And even, how many think the Ten Commandments are good? No arguments there, right? But just thinking you can keep the Ten Commandments makes you okay with, with God. You can't do it perfectly enough, without error enough. It doesn't mature you. It just shows you what the standard is. But once you are in Jesus, your righteousness is now his, not your own. And the new way of living does mature you and grow you up to be like Jesus. Hebrews 14, 10, 14. For by a single offering, the offering of Jesus, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. So the good news is, at the point that you accept Christ, at the point that you step into the family of God, to the point that you are fully and completely his, before God, you are fully formed. And you go, well, but I still kind of mess up. I still have some worries. I have some doubts. I got some stuff going on. Yeah, but now, for the rest of your days, he wants to make you holy. Sanctified means to be made holy. It means to be set apart for God's purpose. He wants to spend the rest of your life setting your life aside for his purpose, not yours. And as you do that, then you, you grow up into the salvation that he's talking about. Now, how active is that? Pretty active. He's doing what he's doing, but not without you. And then finally, active rest is all about pacing yourself. So, when you pray, do you mostly pray that God will make the hard things go away, make your life easier, make your life better? Or do you pray, God, make me stronger? so that I can handle these things that are coming my way. I would argue that we want the first one, and he wants the second one. There are times you get mad at God because he didn't make your life easier, when in reality, what he wanted for you was to make you stronger. I don't know of any athlete that enjoys the practice that will make them great. The practices that make them great are hard, and they're grueling, and they're difficult, but it isn't so that they are just a better track runner or football player or lacrosse player or volleyball player. It's not that. It's that they would become stronger in their sport. Years ago, this kid in my wrestling team, his name was Guy, so we'll just refer to him as that Guy. Okay, Guy. His mom had left the family after his dad had been injured in a construction accident and disabled. So dad could not work. They're on disability. Mom is gone. So Guy is a senior in high school. He's got to work just to help the family, right? Well, he really wanted to wrestle. He's a senior. When I walked into the wrestling room, this is when I first was coaching wrestling, and I saw him, I'm going, oh, I'm going to have to wrestle that. This guy had zero skin fat. You know what that means? Ripped. Just think really, 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 really ripped. Right? Very strong, but fortunately, not as skilled a wrestler as I had feared. But this guy, his life was a mess. I mean, he was living in so much hardship. So through the course of that, that wrestling season, I had opportunity to share with Guy multiple times. If he'd do something stupid and have to go run laps for it, I would go run laps with him. 
And while we're running laps, I would just talk to him. Captive audience. He accepted Christ. His life, even in all the hardship, is just already just so much better. But at the sectionals, guy was a guy that he couldn't beat the guy in his weight class or the guy above that. And in wrestling, you can only go up two weight classes, which means you're wrestling people that are 20 pounds heavier than you. But he was so ripped, nobody even really noticed. So he's wrestling up two weight classes, and he's wrestling a guy that finished very high in the state the year before. And as he's warming up, he's just, uh, you can just tell he's, he's not thinking good, happy thoughts. And it's like, guy, what's up? And he goes, you see that guy over there? And I said, yeah, I know who he is. You know, he did really well in the state last year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, no, look at his T-shirt. Jesus is the strength of my life. The guy's going, how do you beat that? <laughs> Can't beat that. And I said, guy, reality check. Jesus is now the strength of your life too. You're right. <laughs> now, I would argue that athletes... It's just one of those professions that leans toward prayer. And it's always, God, help me win, right? That's always the thing. That's not the right way to pray. The right way to pray, because Jesus may be the strength of their life too. Just help me to do my best, right? So prayed with guy. He went out there, wrestled the guy. The guy is just literally mopping up the mat with him. It was not sight, But the guy made a mistake. Not our guy, the other guy. Made a mistake. And guy pinned him. Which in wrestling means... Match over, right? So guy jumps up. He is so excited. The bottom line is God wants to make us stronger. He wants us to endure. He wants us to hang in there. And even when everything looks bleak, to just trust that he's with us. He is giving us the strength we need. He is helping us to live the best life, the highest and best life that we can live. Hebrews 10, 36. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. He's going, I'm encouraging you guys. You are doing the will of God, but you're fatiguing. You're wearing out. You're, you're dropping by the wayside. I don't want that to be true of you. You need endurance. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, and all of chapter 11 is all the different people of faith that are that crowd of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, the fear and the worry and the anxiety and the stupid games we play and the manipulation and the control, all the things that we do to make our life work. He's saying, throw that all away. And run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. How many of us are just dragging around spiritually? We are weary and we are faint-hearted. And the reason you're here is to have another brother or sister speak into your life so that that's not as true as it was when you walked in. It is not enough. Can I pick on Jonathan? I, about once a month, I like to pick on Jonathan. But when Jonathan was a senior in high school, he thought he was old enough to pick what church he wanted to go to. And I said, great, I, I think you're that old. You're, you can pick, but just know what this means is you will find a church where you can be fully engaged. It's not enough to sit in the back and leave. You have to actually build community. It's a part of the deal. At which point he said, I'll stay at Vista, right? I mean, that was, just, that was just easier, right? But how many of us come in here, don't interact with anybody? Do I think you should be in a community group? Yes, I think you should. But short of that, do I think you should engage with the people who are around you on Sunday morning? Yes. Why? Because you are growing weary. Because you got crazy running around in your head and you need somebody else to fill it with something that's of God. And it's not going to happen by osmosis. I guarantee you, you could stay home and on the internet, you could find a hundred better Bible teachers than me to listen to. If you think you are here to listen to me, you are wrong. My job is to give a word of exhortation. If you listen to the devotionals a day or two ago, he ends the book of Hebrews with, and this is a little short word of encouragement or a word of exhortation 
you know, and, and that's what they called their sermons back then. In the synagogue, if you remember, like Jesus, he'd go into synagogue and he read from the book of Isaiah that one time. They would read scripture and then somebody would give a word of exhortation. It's the beginning of what we now call a sermon, Right? If you think you're here, just, well, it's better to hear us. You'll pay attention better if you're listening. And if you're at home on your computer, you'll probably be doing five other things while you're listening and you just won't get as much. No, I totally think you pay attention at home. You are here for each other. You are here because you need to speak into each other's lives. You need that to endure. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. It was part of what Messiah had to go through, that they would all run, that they would all abandon him, that they would all leave him alone. He has walked that path for you. You no longer have to walk that path. He died so that you don't have to walk his path alone. Hebrews 12, 13. As he goes on, it's just a great picture that he paints. And make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. He's telling you this because if you keep walking around lame, you're really going to hurt yourself. Do you realize that most serious accidents happen after a less serious something happens? If you totally blow out your back, you did something first to kind of set that up, and now it really went out. When you blow out your knee, you did some other things first, and now you really hurt your knee. You didn't take care of it when you were just a little bit lame, and now you're super lame. Yes, I receive that, Lord. I am super lame. What he's saying is, don't make this harder on yourself than you have to. Make straight paths for yourself. Don't don't be wandering off. Strive for peace. He said earlier, strive for rest. Now he says, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one can see the Lord. Hebrews 3.14. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence to the end. Last week I brought up, you know, salvation and can you lose your salvation or not? It's interesting, I'm still getting some conversations this week, left over from last week, now that we've had a week to ponder it. The bottom line is, you know you're his if you endure. And if you are not living your life in such a way as to endure, the book of Hebrews is say you're walking on thin ice. You need to live your life in such a way that that endurance is built in. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end. So for each and every one of us, there are things that, that are holding us back from entering this rest. There are things that are keeping us from fully entering in. And as Hebrews 12 says, it's the weight that will beset us. It's the, it's the sin that keeps us from really entering fully and completely in. So I'm going to go through this list one more time. And as I do, they're not all you. And if multiple ones are you, just say, Jesus, show me the one I need to work on right now. But here they are. Fear and worries, doubt, holding grudges, taking shortcuts, blaming, giving excuses, Playing games, controlling others, emotional manipulation, invalidating, grumbling, negativity, meddling, disrespect, giving up, and then seeing yourself as a victim. That's not an exhaustive list, but you get the point. There's all kinds of things running around in our head that keep us from entering this rest. Let's set aside the old man and put on the new man. Let's all stand for prayer. Lord God, we thank you that as we approach your throne of grace, you have for us a salvation to the nth degree. You want to fully and completely mature us into the image of your son. And it is a lifelong experience. 
So, Lord God, we need to endure. We need to run hard, but run till the end, and run in such a way that we can keep going. Lord God, pour your spirit out on this place. Help us to see what we need to see, and help us to make the choices and live the life that you've called us to live. Lord, for anyone that doesn't know you yet, this, this may sound like nonsense, or it may sound like the best reality that you've ever heard of. Lord God, for anyone that doesn't know you, Lord God, may they have the faith to step into you now and to accept what you have done for them on the cross. And not just on the cross, but every day interceding for us from the right hand of God.